Welcome to the Artist Academy podcast, a place where we focus on the business side of art to help you attract more customers, increase profits, and ultimately live a life of creativity and financial freedom. I'm your host, Andrea Earhart, and this week's episode features New York artist, L. She's been featured in a variety of high-profile brand collaborations, such as Nike, Ralph Lauren, Reebok, just to name a few, and has traveled all around the world painting murals. I always give the advice of doing a free mural or two to get practice and photos when you're just starting out so you can advertise later. But Elle got her start painting, not just for free, but illegally on the streets of New York. (laughs) She put her art in front of passerby eyes to see and get noticed in order to get jobs. She wasn't just spray painting her name up on the wall. No, Elle practiced to create eye-catching art that served as a building block to the career she has now. I'm so impressed by her, and I know you will be too. So let me know what you think about this week's episode with street artist Elle. I guess I am here with Elle and I'm excited to dive into your art business. I see that you use spray cans, so I have some questions about that. But before we get into that, can you give us a little synopsis of how you got to where you are today? Yeah, I have always been an artist. I've always made things and drawn and created. And it's one of the things that I enjoy most in life. And I have been a professional artist for probably about 10 years at this point. And I'm continuing to evolve. So spray paint is, painting big murals is most of my job. That's the majority of it. But my interests span a lot of other mediums. And I'm trying to move into sculpture a bit, which is exciting. Oh, okay. So how did you get started? Did you you start on small canvases and just worked your way bigger? I actually dropped out of art school. So I was painting with oils and acrylics and I went to a post-baccalaureate program for painting and I really disliked it. And I gave up art and quit and moved to New York. And it was there that I discovered wheat pasting. And so I had a friend teach me how to wheat paste. Wait, what is that? Essentially, it's when you draw or paint something on a piece of paper and then you boil wheat in water and you create a paste and then you illegally go put it up on the street. So yeah, you basically, if you're in a city, most of the time you'll see beautiful pictures or paintings or someone's art up on the street or like obey posters or something like that. So those are wheat pasted. And then those come down really quickly, right? So they were getting painted over or taken down really quickly. And so that got me really interested in graffiti. And so I got very heavily involved in graffiti. So that was letter-based tagging, writing, bombing, even painting with fire extinguishers. My name, 30, 50 feet tall, climbing billboards, painting off the side of buildings and just really enjoying that. At that point, I got sponsored by a spray paint company. And once I had free spray paint, I started asking people if I could paint the entire side of their building for free. And so I started painting building facades. And once I started doing that, I started getting invited around the world to paint. And that became my job. Very cool. (laughs) And just like that, now you get invited around the world. What do you mean? Like, where have you gone recently or last year? Yeah, last year I was painting at Strat Museum in Amsterdam and I was speaking at OMR Festival in Hamburg, Germany next to, I was on the same stage as Serena Williams and speaking with Shepard Ferry, which was really exciting. And my friend Yasha Young from Urban Nation Music that I've painted in Berlin a bunch and Malaysia, all over the world, really. How do you get those opportunities? Do people contact you? Do you apply? At this point, people email me. Yeah. At this point, I have so many public walls. That's my main point of contact. So people will all sign with L Street Art, my Instagram handle, and uh, people contact me via email. Very cool. So you're using murals as your permanent advertisement. Love it. It wasn't the idea, but yeah, that's how it's working. Yeah. (laughs) You like speaking? I wouldn't say I love it, but it's a challenge, right? So I am always up for a good challenge and it's really intimidating, I think, but I don't mind it so much. Okay. Yeah. I I get asked to speak sometimes, not necessarily on that big of a stage, but I, every time I'm like, okay. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. If something's challenging, I enjoy it. So I'm weird like that. (laughs) (laughs) Very cool. Okay. How did you start making money as an artist? Who are your first couple customers? And now how do they compare with how do you make money now? 
my first client was like, and they reached out saying <laughs> I was really prolific at that time in New York doing street art and graffiti. Okay. So just doing it for free, basically. And then you got... Illegally. Mm-hmm. Illegally. Not yeah. just free, illegally. Okay. I, love yeah. it. I was obsessed with just making work and putting it on the street in New York, beautifying spaces, collaborating with artists. New York is such a fun space to do graffiti and street art because there's so much walking... People are everywhere and they see things. And so it was really fun. People would see it and it would end up online, your artwork. And that was always really fun for me because before that, when I was in art school, you would paint something, no one would see it. You'd roll it up and you'd put it to die under your bed. So I just thought it was so cool to be able to make art and then give it a life on the street where people could enjoy it or not and pass by and it did its own things. I love this idea that you just started creating it for free because that's how artists do it in all matters. Yeah. You just do it for free. Not only did you do it for free, I love it that it's illegally. You're like, what question on that? So did you do it at night when nobody was there? Or did yeah. you like how mm-hmm. did that? I did get arrested a couple of times, but oh. um <laughs> Yeah, (laughs) that was not super fun. But yeah, so Ikea was my first client and they were doing a street art poster that was me, Crash 4, and a couple others. And it was like a global campaign. So I had a poster for sale in every Ikea worldwide, which was exciting. Very cool. Yeah. And then shortly after that, I got contacted by Reebok and they wanted to do a yoga capsule collection. And I subsequently did another one with them as well. So those were my first three big jobs. And when I got that, I quit bartending. (laughs) Very cool. Okay. So the majority of the stuff that you do nowadays are just big murals for companies like that, like big companies or small companies or... So I would say the majority of my income over the years has been painting big murals. And that means either for cities, for museums, for private clients, such as Nike or whatever. I've always invested in my art and spent money on my art. And so recently I've been trying to get into sculpture. So I actually just finished building Neon Bending Studio. And so I've been going to school out at Pilchuck whenever I can, which is a glass school founded by Dale Chihuly, who's an incredible glass artist. And he started the school in the 70s. And so I got obsessed with blowing and bending glass and trying to create plasma neons. And so I've actually built a studio to bend glass. And I was just doing that this morning. And I'm also making sculpture prototypes out of clay and what do you call this stuff again? Sculpey and all sorts of things. So I've just been getting really weird in the studio lately and really enjoying that. So all of my free time is doing that. I'm trying to just like fully move in that direction. And it's really exciting. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. And I'm making no money on that yet. But hopefully every time someone reaches out for a painting, I'm like, cool. Yeah. Yeah. But would you like a neon instead or like a big sculpture? And a lot of people are like, no. (laughs) I'm like, I will keep trying. (laughs) But you have to feel it. They will come. That's my theory. And so far in life, it's worked out pretty well. I love that. That's so funny. It's so funny how things work like that because you want to build up this thing and you want to make money on it. And like with murals, and then it's just as soon as that's done, it's okay, this is easy now. What other hard thing could I do? Because when I got into coaching artists, I was like, the murals were coming in. And I was like, hey, yeah, I was like, but does anybody want to be coached by me? I just, like, I just that's cool. Yeah. I think it's really important to follow your passion, right? And if you're I have to be really excited about what I'm doing. And I can fall into the groove spray painting and I really do love it. And I feel like I've gotten quite good at it. I also was having a bunch of health issues recently and I just am trying to move away from spray paint generally. Because of the chemical? I think so. Yeah. Wow. Okay. I have an autoimmune disorder called celiac disease. And so that recently turned on and activated and then a number of other issues. And I'm just like trying to cut out things that are not good for me, essentially. Okay. You're talking me out of spray paints now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I wear a full face respirator and a lot of the time I'll be in full gear, but especially inside jobs, they're just pretty nasty. Yeah. No, this is definitely not the first time I've heard this. I used to work on the Bass Pro Shops job sites and there was several, one guy had like cancer in his leg and he was like, this has got to be, because we used to call it getting the foam flu. Like you would do spray foam oh, to uh, make sculptures. That's and sometimes really people- bad for you. Yeah. And like people would wear like dust masks with it. And it's like you would still, and like the, it would get in the whole thing and everybody would just be sick. And it's okay, guys, we got to be better. 
Yeah, there's something to be said for being passionate about your art. And even if you try to protect yourself, like with all the masks and everything, I think a lot still comes in. I like the idea of longevity in my practice and continuing to create. But I also, it's not only that, if I was really obsessed with spray paint, I would probably just disregard it and keep doing it and probably try to avoid inside jobs. Because outside, if there's a little breeze, it's really fine. But I'm just obsessed with the idea of creating in the third dimension currently. Maybe even like the seventh dimension, but I haven't figured that one out yet. <laughs> it's come about, do you follow sculpturists? Sculptors, sculpturists. <laughs> I would say that I was always really into light art and light, just light combinations and things like that. But no, I did an ayahuasca ceremony and I quit art that day. And I was like, okay, I was so overwhelmed by the beauty of the things that I saw. And I, after thinking about it, I was like, okay, surely the universe doesn't want me to just quit art. But I was so overwhelmed by, there's no way I can create things as beautiful as what I just saw. And so it's been a few years that I've been trying to move into this, taking a lot of classes. I took at the JC ceramics class, a 3D printing class. I was trying to learn Fusion 360, which is like AutoCAD. And I'm taking another sculpture class right now. I've failed all of the classes because I end up having to leave for work, but I'm just trying to pick up skills. So I'm an ultimate flunky, but just trying to do my best. I love it. Yeah, no, trying new things is hard for sure. <laughs> Any, anything new. That was great. I've got to go. <laughs> I've, gone for months. <laughs> I've had to go to Peru or wherever and do an ayahuasca ceremony on my bucket list for a long time. And yeah, you definitely do it. Yeah, I've tried like some other crazy stuff and I'm like, I know it's just going to be just a crazy trip and I don't know if I'm going to like it, but I think at the, out of the end of it, it might come something cool. So it's really cool to hear your take on that. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely a difficult and interesting journey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Okay. Okay. Let's go back to what everybody wants to know. And it's like, how are you getting customers now? Do you, how much of a play does your social media play into it? Where do you think maybe besides having art everywhere, is there anything else that artists could maybe do and follow in your path to get, to make money? Yeah. I like business, but I would say that I am not like a lot of people who track everything and ask every client, where did you hear about me? And do all the things that you really should do to be really good at business. I'm really more like, I'm obsessed with art. I just do art and <laughs> I do all the business. I do all the negotiations. I do all the contracts. I do all of that. But I probably could be better if I was really dedicated and cared more about <laughs> the business side. But I do know that, yeah, a lot of the work I did start asking eventually after enough people were like, what do you mean you don't ask your clients how they heard about you? And so a lot of them ended up being like, okay, yeah, your mural. I saw, for example, the RBG mural, which the Ruth Bader Ginsburg mural that I painted in New York was an invitation by someone named Simon Isaacs, who is with Into Action, this organization who also hired Shepard Ferry to create the Hope poster for Obama. And so when RBG passed away, they called and they said, hey, we really would like you to do the official portrait for RBG. And I said, I can't. I'm sorry. I'm busy for the next three months. And they said, okay, too bad. And then they called back and said, you know what? We'll wait, which is really cool. But having opportunities like that where a client will pay me money and also pay for wall space in New York because wall space is not even free nowadays in big cities. You have to pay as an artist or a client to have that wall space. Doing a big project with Ralph Lauren, they paid for an entire street corner and then paid me on top of that to create a big project for them. Having amazing clients is obviously really helpful for creating an even bigger brand. But I guess I would just say I'm always creating, I'm always putting myself out there, I'm always putting my work out there. I'm not dedicated to social media. Sometimes I just go offline for a month or so. It's probably not great also. But I just sometimes you just got to do you and focus on what's really important in your life. No, I, I think this is definitely going to speak to a lot of people because I'm very business minded. I like that side of it. But I love to hear this kind of perspective because to me, what I'm picking up is if you just get really good at your craft and you love it a lot, and then you make sure that your stuff is being seen and then you treat your customers really well and you do a really good job and it's mostly focusing on the art that is being made and your process with it and all the things in that, it's not necessarily 
outreach or how good it looks on social media. It's if as long as the product is really good and it comes from a passionate place, then it's of course it's, you're going to get recommended. Yeah, and let's say I was really broke and I really needed money and I wanted to be painting murals. I would go ask anyone with a blank wall right now if I could go paint their wall for free. Yeah. And I would put my signature on it and I would just do as many of those as possible. So in whatever way that you want to be making money, I would just put myself out that way and just like offer as a favor to go do stuff. So I'm always like, you invest and then people will come back and pay you for it. Yeah, you know, definitely. I'm not sitting around waiting for people to say, hey, will you pay me to do this thing? If I want to do that, I'm going to be proactive and do that. Yeah, just like you're doing with, with your sculptures. Nobody's, you're pitching it. And nothing's landing quite yet, but you're being prepared. You're putting yourself in where when the opportunity presents itself, you're going to be prepared. And I've been on this trajectory of learning sculpture and taking classes for almost two years now, almost three. So I've been quietly working away on the side and trying to learn these things. And now I'm starting to get ready where I'm like, okay, I'm starting to be able to show what I'm doing a little bit, starting to feel more comfortable, letting people in on that because I was keeping it very private and under under wraps because I'm very bad at it. I'm a I'm new. I'm a beginner in all of these things. So it's not that's bad, but also it's like there's nothing to be proud of to show these things yet. So I want to be like, wow, look what I've done. Yeah, for sure. What is your process like? So say somebody reaches out to you for a mural, do you talk about ideas with them? When do you get a deposit? Do you get a deposit? Can you just talk us through your process? A lot of artists like to know the step by step. Should I be taking a deposit before I give them anything or how much should I, what questions should I ask? Yeah, definitely. Good question. So let's say someone writes me an email and they would like a mural. I'm hoping that already in the email, they'll have attached a photograph of the wall in the dimensions. And if not, that's the first thing I'll be asking for in the email. I'm also hoping that they've written me being like, hey, we saw your work here and we really loved this piece. If not, I might say, hey, can you look through my work and tell me which pieces you really like or what you identify with or what you're looking for? And for example, I recently had someone reach out who him and his partner had seen me painting in Strat Museum in Amsterdam this year, or just last year. And they were like, we really want you to come paint. And we have a lot of children in the neighborhood and we'd like to have kids on the wall playing maybe or something like that. And I was like, you know what? Really cool, but I'm really not comfortable painting children. I've just never liked it. I'm not good at it. I don't want to become the person that paints children. If you paint one kid, someone who likes paintings with kids is going to be like, I want a wall like that and reach out to you. So you really have to control, at least at this point in my career, I feel like I'm really careful about what I'll put on a wall because if I don't want to keep going in that direction, then I don't want to put it out there in public. I was like, hey, I'm really honored that you'd like my work. I can do something abstract. I can do floral. I can do in my style. They were interested in something indigenous. I'm like, if you know any indigenous people of that a specific tribe you're speaking of, please put me in touch. I want to make sure that we're culturally okay and we have permission and all of these things. Putting things in the public sphere is also, you have to be a little bit careful, right? Because you don't want to be infringing on, let's say I'm painting in a black neighborhood. I don't want to come in there and paint a white girl. That would be really offensive. It would be really intrusive. It's not thoughtful. You don't want to go to Australia maybe and paint an animal that they don't have there. Maybe you do, but then you're making a statement or do you know what I'm saying? So you want to be really culturally sensitive because you're in public. You want to be taking into account the native plants, the native people, and what you're respecting, what you're honoring. And is it a gift or is it an intrusion? So anyways, back to the email. Okay. So first email, I'll say, okay, once I have the dimensions of the wall and the picture, I'll give them a quote. Okay. This is going to be this much. And depending on the client, I'll either do 50% or one third up front. So one third of the total fee or 50% upfront before any sketches. And then the sketches all say there are these many revisions allowed. And then you have to pay again if you want to restart from scratch or something after three or four sketches. Okay. That's a very time consuming process for me personally. So then I have a 
terms and conditions form that I send people. And it basically states all of the things like the deposit is non-refundable, this many sketches you get, and then we restart, blah, 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 just outlining all of that. If I don't have a restroom at the site, someone needs to come watch my paint, or I need a lift, or I need... What do you need at a wall, basically? If you're going to be in the middle of nowhere or somewhere where someone's going to come steal your paint and no one else is there to watch, you're just going to have to consider all the things that you need as an artist, right? Do you have access to the site? For me personally, I like to say I want to sign my work wherever I like to sign it, as big or as small as I want to. I do my work on my terms whenever I want to, unless there's a construction team or someone that I need to work around or with. Please put me in touch with them so I can schedule with them. Or if there's a video crew involved, otherwise... With the deadline, I'll get work done on my own timeline. Just basically because I don't like people being like, be here at 8 a.m. and be gone by 3 unless there's a good reason for it. I'd rather avoid people and be there making a stinky mess when people are not there. Yeah, once I get the deposit, then I start working on sketches. And then once the sketches are approved, I'll ask for the second deposit if it's one of three. And then we'll schedule a time for the wall. So yeah, that's that part of it. Yeah, no, the, everybody I talk to, it's some version of that. Like we're all pretty much the same. It's some yeah. some will take. Yeah. Always get a deposit. The yeah. one or two times that I've been really brushed, even by a really big client, it was an in-between client for a project with ASICs. I paid out of pocket. It was really rushed up, never got paid. Whoa. <laughs> so yeah, even a big client, you just have to be really careful because it wasn't ASICs. It was a company in between working with ASICs. But you just always, doesn't matter if it's rushed. You need to get a deposit. If they want it done, they'll pay you. <laughs> I know I've definitely done that in the past where people just, you know, they just want to see this little sketch that for you so they, they can go present it to their board or something. And then it's just like crickets. And I'm like, I spent a few hours on that. <laughs> like, right, okay, right. Fine. It's that time you need to get paid. Exactly. Yeah. So tell me what you're excited about. Is there a sculpture idea that you have in your head where you're like, how do I make this come to fruition? Yeah. yeah. I Man, it's really cool because my neighbor has a glass blowing studio. And so we're going to continue to experiment with these blown glass and bent neon pieces. And so I'm really excited that literally this week, I just got this neon studio up and running. So I have neon sketches that I'm really interested in and bringing that into in with the blown glass is going to be really cool to bring that into more of a 3D space and try to create sculptural stuff with neon. So neon traditionally is used for advertisement and it's mostly two-dimensional. It's flat, right? I like the idea of creating a three-dimensional neon. It's really fragile. So getting it to stand in space is a big challenge. So I'm working on that. And then I'm working on... I have this huge clay thing that I'm working on right now. So it's like creating things in 3D and trying to incorporate multimedia right now is what I'm trying to do. Just like successfully build in three dimension and incorporate multimedia. Yeah. So once I start to do that, then I do have a bunch of visions of things that I would like to create. But it's like just learning to make things in the third dimension is really difficult. So <laughs> start how do they stand? What do they sit on? Where do they like? How do they plug in? How do they work? Is it safe outside? Are you going to electrocute someone? Is there metal? Is there water? I mean, a lot right now, but I'm very excited. Do you sketch these ideas out beforehand? I do. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Do you have a sketchbook full of all these ideas? And I have so many sketchbooks and have random pieces of paper everywhere that I'm just drawing on. I really should try to get more organized on that because I'm like, which sketchbook was that thing in? And then <laughs> like, some of them are five years old. And I'm like, this is weird. What's that? And the newer stuff in it. So this year I was thinking, maybe I should try to get more organized with the sketchbooks and just have, okay, this is the sketchbook this month right now. <laughs> Oh no, you're such an artist. I love it. It's with the sketches. I am such a business person that I like do everything electronically. Like I'll do it on my iPad and procreate, but I really love that just artist sketchbook idea. And I've always tried to get into it, but I'm just not the artist sketchbook person. So I love to hear that you are and that they're everywhere. And I'm like, oh, she's such an artist. There was a, a while I would say where I was not drawing at all, quite a few years. And so drawing is a new part of my practice again to get into the 3D space. Because in order to do my mural painting, I would collage things in Photoshop only. And so that would be photographs I take or find, imagery that I find on Pinterest even. And so there was no drawing involved in my process. So drawing is a new thing that's coming into my practice. And I started tattooing as well. So I'm doing these little fake skin tattoos, which is really fun, but I hope to... I've been pouring, what's it called? Latex. 
So I cast my hand, for example, in latex and started tattooing that. I've always really loved figurative things. When I was in college at UC Davis, I created a class with this woman, Sundance, and we would draw cadavers in the medical center morgue. So we would go down and draw sliced up arms and stuff to see the musculature and everything. So I love that's coming back into my practice, the idea of being able to cast the body part, tattoo it, maybe incorporate some neon, bring it together with something else. Just get really weird. Yeah, just get really weird. I love it. And as artists, I think that's just, just that's such a joy for us to be able to do. It's, I just want to get weird today. Let's, let's think yeah. Of weird today. yeah, one of my goals this year is just to be very playful. Oh, I like that. Playful. Yeah. Okay. I have a new series in my head and I'm just like jotting notes down and I'm like, I, I like that. Playful and weird. Yeah. It's always a good thing. Just have, having fun with it. <laughs> it's so, so much about the process too than, than what it is, the end result. But yeah. Okay. So last question, what is some advice that you would give like a younger version of yourself or somebody who hears this and says, oh, I want to be her. I want to do what she's doing. And like, what is some good advice? For somebody who's just starting out. Interesting. Just keep working. Don't wait for people to pay you. There's always an excuse to not make artwork. I would not try to make it my livelihood for a while. If I was a budding artist, I would get a bartending job or something where the pressure is not financially on the art. Because as soon as you get a commission, maybe for one thing, a lot of artists feel like they have to stick with that one thing. And I think it's really important to allow yourself to continue to evolve as an artist and to follow what you really, and to keep doing that and keep experimenting and keep pushing. So one, I wouldn't depend on it financially. I would get another job serving or whatever and do all the art on the side, in the back, like work like it's your full-time job, but have another job getting the money in. And then, yeah, just make sure that you don't pigeonhole yourself into something that you're not obsessed with. Yeah, I like that. I'm thinking about how I was pigeonholed a couple of times and then had to break out of it. And I'm like, oh yeah, that, that, I totally get that. But yeah, make sure you're having fun and staying playful. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> okay, I love it. Thank you so much for taking the time with us today. And thank you. Yeah, well, it's so impressive. All the brands that you worked with, I'm like, you go girl. That is so cool to see. Uh, thank you so much. I feel really grateful. The most recent one was Kohler and they were an amazing client. I did a whole bathroom suite, a bathtub, a sink, a toilet. They brought me out to Milan for design week last year. And it was just a dream. It was so cool. And they have this incredible artist studio. I'm hoping to go back out there and work with them at some point because they have these residencies where you can work with a professional potter, for example. And so you come in with an idea and that they help you to build it. There are amazing companies out there that really want to push art and creativity and help artists. And it's just not all of them, but some of them are really fantastic. And so I feel really blessed to be able to have worked with some great collaborators and companies and people. So very cool. Yeah. So cool. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was so nice to chat with you, Andrea. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Artist Academy podcast. I've been putting out at least one episode per week for more than four years on this podcast. And it's really cool to see those download numbers go up and up as time goes on. And that's because artists like you listen and share these episodes. So really, when I say thank you, I mean it. <laughs> it's really cool to see progress along the way. And anyway, if you like this type of art and business content, then I highly encourage you to get the audio version of my book, Mural Money, with over 15 hours of listening inspiration. I'm currently running a special of just $17 for the audio version. You can go to muralmoney.com to find it. And that comes with a bunch of extras like my art supply list, my pricing guide, recommended book and podcast list, and so much more. I filled that book with tips from my art journey of building a profitable mural career. Plus, I've included the best of the best advice from guests I've interviewed on this podcast. It's the most affordable all-in-one book of advice on art and business that I have. And if you enjoy listening to me here, then I know you'll like the book too because I read it myself all 15 hours of it. <laughs> the book is available on Amazon and Audible normally for $25, but if you go to muralmoney.com, that is where you can grab the special $17 deal while it lasts. If you haven't listened to my book yet, this is your sign to do it. Again, normally $25, 
I'm running a special for $17, but you have to go to muralmoney.com. That's where you can grab the audio version of it. And that's all I have for you today. So I will see you next week for another episode of the Artist Academy podcast.